So thank you so much for joining us here today on Talking Travel with Wendy. Thank you, Pam. Uh, Pam and I know each other from Elizabethtown College where I went to school for a year and we played soccer together, but Pam has been super busy since our days uh, in Pennsylvania. So welcome, Pam. Thank you, Wendy. It's so great to see you again. So, so tell us a little bit about what you have been up to. Oh boy. Um, since college, well, it's been 30 years since we have left, which is uh, really um, hard to believe. Um, but yeah, I've just been, I'm still involved with sports and I'm still an active athlete. So I've uh, gone from playing basketball and running in college to paddle sports. And that's been pretty much my focus since 1992. And yeah, so it's it's literally taken me around the world. So what I found was a sport that could help me travel the world and see different cultures and meet different people. And I found that sport was just this amazing universal language. You didn't even have to speak the same language. All you had to do was just show somebody a paddle or show somebody a basketball. And, so when did you uh, and, when did you start with yeah. canoeing and kayaking? It was actually kind of weird. I, I've been working for the federal government for the last 30 years, but I used to play basketball at the at the recreational center at the Naval Hospital in Bethesda when I was. Oh yeah. There. So I used to play basketball in the gym with guys and all the time. And I was just over at the bulletin board one day and the recreational director came up to me and I was looking at this ad to try out for the national team for the wow. first US, US women's swan boat team that was gonna compete in the World Swan Boat Championships in Thailand. This is 1992. The, the coach worked at the hospital as a researcher and he was having tryouts just to put together this first ever US Women's National Team to, to compete in the first ever World Swan Boat Championships to allow women. So it was 1992 was the year of the woman in Thailand. So I wasn't really into the women's stuff until this experience. It really opened my eyes about yeah. the inequities um, for, for women around the world. Anyway, so I made the team and I went to Thailand and it just it changed my life. It was life altering for me because I had never I had never flown before either. And yes, yeah, so that, that opened up all these doors for me for paddle sports. Oh, that's so cool. So Pam, you are a voice and an advocate for women in sports. And so I'd like to have you share with us a little bit about Women Can International. Thank you. Well, the, the women's sort of awareness for me kind of started in 1992 when I, when I went to Thailand for that first ever World Swan Boat Championships where women were somehow recognized as human beings for the first time and we had events. But it wasn't until 1999, I was doing sprint kayak at my canoe club, the Washington Canoe Club in Washington, DC. And I didn't really know what, what the Olympic system was like. I just knew that women only paddled kayaks and they allowed women to, they, they had a women's canoe race partner, uh, Kelly um, and a, one other woman, they, the three of us paddled in a, a, paddled in a women's canoe event at a, at a, at a regatta in like June, 1999. And so I hadn't really paddled in the boat before, but instead of sitting and paddling with a double blade, I was kneeling paddling with a single blade, which was really hard. Um, so you have to ba basically the goal is stay up, go straight, finish. So that was my first race, but this is, you know, you have sometimes these pivotal moments in life where you yeah. sort of find your purpose. Well, that's what kind of happened at this time, but it actually happened out of failure. So the gun goes off and I'm actually shooting out ahead and I'm in the lead going into the finish line by a lot. And there's actually a lot of people on the shore shouting and cheering. And I got a little nervous. I got a little psyched out from all the people cheering. And literally three meters from the finish line, I saw this gigantic orange buoy and I kind of had a panic attack and freaked out and I fell in. So I actually didn't even cross the finish line. And so you heard this collective moan from the shore and it was like really, but it was like for the first time in my life, utter failure and embarrassment was for whatever reason, it wasn't, it didn't feel like failure in that moment for the first time ever. And a, and like to me, I'd won the race because I, I was ahead, but I'd won because I had done something I didn't think I could do, but I also did something that people didn't think women could do. But I just felt like I belonged in that boat, even though I completely fell out of the boat before the finish line. 
And, uh, and then I, you know, I, you know, met this woman, Sheila Kuiper, who was a pioneer for women's canoe from Canada. She visited our club and she was on a mission to get women's canoeing events into the Olympics. So that was my aha of, oh, wow, that now I understand why we don't paddle them because women, they don't have events in the Olympics and that trickles down to local levels. Oh, so sure. Athletes go where the opportunities are. There were no opportunities for women in this. So from that point on, I was committed to being a part of that mission to get women's canoe events into the Olympics. Canada was the first country in the world to allow women to uh, have women only events at their national championships in 1995. It actually took men in power and some women in power, but there's usually the men in power right. to say, okay, we need to give women these opportunities. So they opened the door. Sheila was, you know, a million times national champion in Canada, but in 1998, Remember, this is a time period where 10 years out from an Olympics for 2008, Toronto is bidding against Beijing for the oh, right. 2008 Olympics. Toronto was putting women's canoe events uh, on their program if they would have won that bid. So Sheila was connected with a woman who was working on the Toronto bid committee. And so that was a part of the campaign. So I have this gigantic poster at home called Power and Grace for 2008. And it's an amazing picture of Sheila in her canoe. And that was just like, you know, my go-to picture, you know, from that point on. So she was traveling the world um, promoting, but they were running up against a lot of patriarchy and misogyny and it's, yeah. it's a male dominated sport. So that, that began the big trek for me. And she invited me to Mexico City in 2000 to be a part of a, a women's canoe camp. And that was when I heard that in the U.S., so I learned um, in March of 2000 that USA Canoe Kayak was going to open up three men's events to women at the U.S. Nationals that year. So they opened up three men's intermediate events. So they opened up three men's events. And I was the only woman to compete in the singles events. And I got my Canadian friend Heather, Heather McNee to paddle in this C2 double canoe 500 meter event with me. And we won the, 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 the men's intermediate 500 events. <laughs> That's so, awesome! So I, I have pictures of me of my bronze medal in the C1 1000. Yeah, that was, that was a breakthrough. But, but the U.S. in 2001, USA Canoe Kayak had to change, so they had to change their bylaws to actually allow women. They had to write the word women in there, that women were allowed to compete. So 2001, they changed the name for the men's events to open events and let women race in all of the men's events. And then in 2002, USA Canoe Kayak changed its bylaws again to, to have women's canoe events in all ages and categories for the first time ever. We finally had a league of our own in 2002. <laughs> yeah. So we were the second country behind Canada. Yes, it was exciting. So it was exciting to be a part of that. It's one thing to have women's canoe events at the nationals or at the world championships or at a Pan American championships. But if, if one thing to have events, but if the girls and women didn't have access to the same environment for success as the men, right. we were never gonna perform. But yet normally the critics were the people who were there at the performance stage to say, oh, they couldn't do X, Y, or Z. It's just like, well, you've gotta look back to see what did they have to help them get there. Yeah. And it's, there's a lot of systemic barriers that are still in place. Sure. And too often it's, you know, it's for, for, for women and girls of, of color as well. And then we, you know, and, and you know, women and girls with disabilities or even athletes generally with disabilities. So we just have to be aware of these little barriers. Sometimes just there's, it's unconscious that we just don't recognize it. But the more we talk about it, I think the better. So there's equality and then there's equity and then there's justice, I guess. But it's one thing to say, yay, we have a men's team. And yay, we have a women's team. But the women have the, have the lowest budgets. They yeah. don't have the best equipment. You know, they may not have per, their full time coaching. Um, the coaches might get paid, you know, three you know three dollars for every one hundred dollars that the men are paid. So there's equality, but there's not equity. 
Right. And, you know, and that's still happening today. So you have to, we have to talk about it so people can be more aware. So what new projects are you doing <laughs> right now? Well, the women's canoe stuff, basically it, it put me in a position where I was both an athlete, but also kind of an activist too. So I, it was, um, in 2014, I was invited to the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville, Kentucky, to be a part of a panel on athletes for social change. So athletes who have leveraged their voice and platform as athletes in sports to talk about and speak about things that, that, that matter, justice issues. Being a part of that panel, I met a man named Sam Parfit. He became good friends with me. He was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He was a, an athletic director at a private school in Chattanooga for at-risk kids. And he was teaching mindfulness to oh, eight wow. year olds. And so he was talking about mindfulness and access, you know, like parkour for people with disabilities. And, um, and they had other women, you know, a woman there talking about, you know, access for at-risk kids. You know, I was talking about social justice issues with equality. And so we all started to talk about how we've got athlete we're physical performance issues now we've got we've got mental health issues that we need to deal with and my, my uh, and well-being how can we enhance the mental aspects of sport but how can we also merge all of this into athletes have a platform they're usually models in their schools in their colleges in their communities how can we empower athletes to recognize that they have a voice and to either just be an advocate for the little kids sitting by themselves getting bullied at the lunch table all the way up to people that are you know raising a fist on a podium yeah to um so so what that morphed to is sam uh started that it was the brainchild for the true athlete project and that's the, the true athlete project.org and it was a reimagining sport as just a training ground for uh, a holistic approach to athlete development, but looking at sport as a platform for a more compassionate society, for a social change. And we do that through nurturing the body, the mind, and the spirit, mm -hmm. and nurturing our connection to other people and to nature and the environment and our, our responsibilities in our, in our communities and leveraging sport to bring about social change. So the True Athlete Project is based in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We have a global athlete mentoring program. So I'm the co-director for the global athlete mentoring program. So everything's virtual right now. Yeah. Um, but we also have coaching education and we have, you know, we have a lot of mindfulness training classes. We have forged relationships with more UK sport organizations uh -huh. and in Denmark, uh, the other co-director for the mentoring program is Lawrence Holstead and he is the program director for Danish fencing. So we haven't yet branched out to US organizations. So we, we, we spoke at the American Volleyball Coaches Association in December. So shout out to the ABCA for giving us that platform. So the goal is to forge more relationships, not just in the Olympic movement, but with club programs. Sure. To, to shift the mindset from you know sport as an all about winning to sport as a training ground for developing whole people human beings who are just performing yeah. an act of sport and then using that to make people better make the communities better make society better sure so we can we, we, and we know that that is not mutually exclusive to high performance. Right. So we see this, but we know that sport has such so many positive things. It's been such a positive force in my life, but we've seen and heard too many stories where sport has had too many negative impacts where coaches are, you know, constantly yelling and being physically and, you know, verbally abusive to athletes or, you know, we, we've now are reading more stories about sexual abuse of athletes in gymnastics and a lot of the Olympic sports, wrestling. So we're, we're seeing the positive parts of sport, but we're realizing and people are finally finding their voice to talk about the negative sides of sport. But we have an opportunity to change that dialogue. Coaches Absolutely. don't have to be abusive to get people to realize their true potential. There's a different way. 
So that's why part of our coaching is not just to help athletes, to empower athletes, but to empower coaches for a different language and different skill set that can still achieve high performance, all while trying to preserve that human that you're trying to mold and shape. Yeah. You don't have to crush that human spirit, which some athletes, it's 40 years later, they're still realizing and feeling the impacts of things that happened to them when they were kids. Sure. We, we can do better. We can do better as, yeah. as sports general. Well, just, just interviewing at, at Jesse Owens and um, the impact his coaches had on his life, uh, his yeah. middle school coach, and then yeah. his uh, coach at Ohio State. And uh, yeah. they just had, uh, and it seemed as if both of them were absolutely concerned about his whole well-being uh his yeah. middle school coach because he was from a family of 10 was concerned about him not having enough calories and uh would supplement his his food sources because mm -hmm. uh he wasn't getting enough for the training that he thought he was capable of doing. So, uh, so I totally agree that, um, you, you have a mentor program and a mentee program. Well, it's the global athlete mentoring program. So we get elite and Olympic level Paralympic and Olympic athletes to be mentors. And then we have athletes ages 15 through 24 who are the mentees and they sign up. Um, right now, we're sign, sign up is open for our FY or FY. I'm saying government term, but our 2021. Oh, yeah. So it's so it's I said a fiscal year. Yeah, the weird. Uh, but but I knew what you yeah. were talking about. <laughs> Isn't that scary? Yeah. So you can sign. People can sign up now to be either a mentee or a mentor in our in our um, athlete mentoring program. And you don't have to be in the Olympic track. So we're not wedded to that, but, but people who are looking at getting the most and being their utter best every day in the sports that they choose and leveraging those sport as that training ground for being better humans and making society a more compassionate place to be. Yeah. So, yeah. Very cool. With Sam, I started to recognize through my own mental health issues and my own sporting career that there should be no shame in talking about mental health issues or being open about empowering coaches and other people to let's let's address this let's be able to talk about it and yeah. so all of this is now morphed into our curriculum which has five pillars you know it's performance we talk about identity and values um, we have mindfulness training we talk about community and social responsibility and nature and connectedness as all part of the well-being part of it and it's just, it's, it puts it all together. It's not just like, like some people misinterpret what we're doing as kind of sports psychology, but it goes well beyond and deeper than just sports psychology. It's not just about positive thinking. It's no, but like you said, mind, body, and soul. And I think um, when you have that balance, then you, it, you can have a pathway to excellence. Right. It's, it's, it's not mutually exclusive. And even at, 52, I'm still an active athlete. I'm still competing. And yes, I still, I try to eat really well, but I also make sure that I'm nurturing my soul, my spirit every day, that I'm surrounding myself with good, kind, compassionate people, mm -hmm. that I'm, that I'm continuously learning every day, that I'm practicing gratitude. You know, every, you know, every time we, we have to wash our hands 8 million times a day, right? People say, I don't have time to meditate. If you're washing your hands for 20 seconds, and if you're not, shame on you. But if you're washing your hands for those 20 seconds, you can give yourself some gratitude. Like I wish myself peace and safety and health. And in that same in that same 20 seconds, I can say, I wish Wendy peace and safety and calm and health. And in 20 seconds, you've washed your hands in due diligence, but she's also you've also helped soften your soul a little bit right. and extended a message for someone into the universe. And that's just one little practice you can do every day or just before you go to bed or when you wake up in the morning. Sure. Like I'm really, I'm really grateful that I have a car that drives today. Or I'm really grateful that I have, you know, food that I can eat or that I have clean water. 
um, yeah. or that I can speak or that I can move. And just taking a step back where um, it, it, it checks you, it brings you into the moment. And people say, well, what does that have to do with high performance? It has everything to do with nurturing your best human self and the healthier and happier you are as a person, you bring that right. to whatever you're doing in life, to your relationships, to your job, to your sport. Yeah. And I still feel like my best as an athlete is yet to come. So in my sort of activism, you know, with all my women's canoe stuff, um, I got connected with a lot of women's organizations and uh, I was really inspired by Nancy Hall, Ted Makar, who is a three-time Olympic gold medalist, 1984. Uh, Olympics and she started an organization called Champion Women and um, she advocates for women empowerment and she's a lawyer and she's been fighting for justice and accountability in the Olympic movement. So they, there's actually a petition out now that I encourage people to sign on to which okay. is new legislation to get more accountability in the Olympic movement and I encourage people to sign that petition. It's the it's team integrity. It's it's help pass Senate Bill 2330. It's called the Empowering Olympic and Amateur Athletes Act of 2019. Yes, it's USOPU.info. USOPU.info. When people go to that website, USOPU.info it, it can bring some context to documentaries like Broken Trust, Ending Athlete Abuse. And I also encourage people to watch the documentary called Athlete A, and that's specific to gymnastics. Um, and there's a, and, and, but that could give some context for what we're trying to fix in the Olympic movement, where athletes don't have a voice and we're basically just cogs in the wheel while administrators make lots of money and have lots of lucrative contracts while essentially we have slave labor in our in our sporting movement and we need to shift that paradigm where athletes have a voice at the table and that the whole person can be brought to the table as well absolutely um yeah, yeah. so there's just some big projects so so i was a big supporter of the broken trusts film and director jill yesco and i had a little small cameo in that documentary so i was grateful for that I love learning from other people who are doing really amazing things and I want to be like them. And so the more I connect myself with them, you know, I want to support them. If I can support them financially, I will. Um, but if I can lend my voice and lend any skills, I'm going to try to do it. Yeah. And in, pad in paddle sports right now, when we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's not just gender issues, but we think about, you know, how can we make sport more inclusive and inviting for everyone? And, and so you don't see a lot of black and brown people in paddle sports, so that's an issue for me. And we wanna get people that might be differently abled to get their wheelchair on a SUP board or yeah. to be able to have access to waterways. Right. Um, so that's, and so I'm part of a paddle But they need to have access committee. for everything, um, the coaches yeah. and sporting facilities and equipment. Correct. And yeah. Everything. Absolutely. Yeah. We need to make sure everybody has the same environment for success and the same access to the same environment for success. Yeah. That's, that's a tough, that's a tough row to use a rowing term. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me here today, Pam. And I look forward to catching up again in the future and seeing where everything and following and getting on the true athlete project. And thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Wendy. Hi, thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I have much more content on my website, travelwithwendy.net, and you can also support this channel by becoming a Patreon patron. The links are below. Remember, it's always an adventure when you travel with Wendy.